So what do you think? Maybe let's start uh, at, at five past two. Okay. Just to wait a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The time is 14.05. We are five minutes behind time. My name is Muzi Hadebe. So I'm in Kilikambele right now. I just wanted the, the spirit of Dr. Kili to be with me. So I'm going to uh, take out my video. Uh, I'm so happy that today we are doing this for somebody that I will call a visionary. There are so many uh, attributes that we can say to uh, Dr. Kili Campbell, but I would like just to call her a visionary. And then let me take this opportunity and give it to Dr. Roshni Petha. Thank you. Good, good. So good day and a warm welcome to the 2022 Dr. Kelly Campbell Annual Lecture. Prof. Moshe Moshevela, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation at UKZN, members of the Executive Management, our guest speaker, Ms. Lisa Nkongu, members of Senate, academics and professional staff, members of the Advisory Board, Campbell Collections, the Director of Library Services, Dr. Nantan Nobo, alumni, students, the media, family and friends, and distinguished guests. A warm welcome to you. The annual Dr. Kelly Campbell Lecture invites prominent people to engage in dialogue on historical and social issues. When Dr. Cam Kelly Campbell died in 1965, her valuable collection of books, pamphlets, excerpts, photographs, maps, 
newspapers, journals, and paintings, as well as a notable collection of manuscripts passed to the University of Natal, and now the University of KwaZulu-Natal, which has since then administered the collection and continues, yeah, and continues to add to it. So with that introduction, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Ms. Sibasiso Mbongzu. Ms. Sibasiso lectures in the Department of History at UNISA. She's also a PhD candidate at the University of Johannesburg, their Department of History. Ms. Nkongo holds a Master's of Arts degree. She received that cum, summa cum, uh, cum laude. In gen, her topic for her Master's was Gender Women and the Black Consciousness Movement uh, for the period 1968 to 1977. And her supervisor was Dr. Nafisa Isup Sheikh. So having taught history for years before joining academia on a full-time basis, her goal is to become an academic well-versed and published in gender studies in Africa. She sees herself as part of the scholarly and societal conversations about gender equality, particularly drawing on the experiences of Black women in South Africa. She's currently doing a PhD, and, and the topic is the history of Black women in social research in South Africa for the period 1960 to 1994. And she's currently in her second year of her PhD. So over um, to you, Ms. Kong. Thank you so much, Roshini, and good afternoon to everyone. Thanks again for the very generous um, invite to speak to everyone today. I'll quickly share my screen. Right, so I just want to preface with this, that Black women in the history of South Africa have been researchers. And I think this is very important, especially for me, um, you know, as a, as a young girl entering the university space, um, doing my undergraduate studies and even honors really, struggling to find or come across um, women who looked like me, who uh, may have done the very same work that I'm doing and, and who made an impact that was big enough to have their work as, as readings, right? Set readings in, in, in gender history lectures and, and programs. And I, I think for me to internalize this information with the research that I'm currently doing and know that actually they, they were there and that they existed and that the, the work that they did was good enough, right? Kind of um, empowers me and, and empowers me in my capabilities as well. So I think it's important for me to do that um, and maybe declare that in this space um, so that people are aware of the significance of, of such work. So, you know, these women participated in the process um, of conducting field work, either as research assistants, and this was mostly to white academics and, and, and white research institutions, because we know the history of South Africa and, and the education system of uh, Bantu education was highly racialized and, and gendered in many ways, right? So it, it relegated Black women into this, you know, intellectual, you know, bottom, really. Um, and so it created an environment where Eurocentric and androcentric uh, narratives, which is male-centered narratives, were taken as truth about the lives of Black women. And so these, these Black women that you see on your screen uh, uh, right now um, did do important work. They did do important research work, even if it was within these limitations. Um, and, and through that, we're able to participate in, in conversations around the experiences and conditions of their own lives, subjective selves, but also um, of the lives of other Black women. And I think this is an important point to say, how did they conversate, debate, um, face the reality of capitalism, racism, and the different patriarchies um, that they came across, um, not just for an understanding of themselves and their experiences, but an understanding of other women um, who may not have shared the same identity as them, right? So class um, is a very important um, element of that. Um, social, religious uh, differences, spatial differences um, meant that Black women were not having the same um, 
you know, conditions. So th this is important in, in us understanding that uh, knowledge was constructed by, by, by other Black women for the purposes um, of bringing light into what Black women in South Africa were, were, were living. So um, the research that I'm doing involves a process of excavating that work, right, and, and finding moments um, and spaces where the women fulfilled this, this role of a researcher. And I'm trying to show that despite them not being part of the main academic discourse, so what was happening in the universities, what we are doing here today, um, they were deeply invested in the making of that knowledge that became public discourse, right? So they, they may have done this in a range of different ways. So the key questions that are framing today's talk um, would be that, how did Black women attempt to construct um, knowledge about themselves? Um, how did they construct the knowledge about other Black women? Uh, why did they engage in this process of knowledge production and, and what then were the implications of their work, even though they not um, overtly included in, in um, you know, historical and social science um, publications of the time. So I, I want to bring the work um, to the fore, um, not just for the sake of making it visible, um, or, or showing that it existed, but I think it's important for us to, to bring it in as a way of showing the new perspectives of how Black women were seen and written about in history, and perhaps uh, as a way of gaining a deeper understanding into how they may have conceptualized and theorized their own oppression, right? How, how they envisioned their own emancipation. And I think it's important for feminist scholars to, to start doing that kind of work if, if we are going to participate in, in you know, the latest debates and conversations on decoloniality in the academic space space and um, how African epistemology and indigenous knowledge systems um, are, are important in shaping that, right? And I think before we jump to that, it's worth going back to this particular conference uh, that was hosted by um, the University of Natal in 1991. Um, it, it was organized by the Gender Research Group and the, the, the collections of the Gender Research Group are, are with your um, archive. Um, the, this was the first that brought together women of a range of, you know, a, academic, political, social organizations um, to reflect, right, academically, right, on the position of Black women in South Africa, and maybe also conversations about how Black women are to be included um, as constituents in the new imagined um, democracy um, and constitution of the ANC, because we know that a lot of activity at this time was happening um, around around that um, ending above date and, and bringing in a new dispensation. So how did the, the, the women tr try to feature themselves within um, those conversations? And it was through conferencing. But this particular one, I think, was important because um, it revealed that Feminism in South Africa hasn't been a one size fits all, right? That there, there's so many different um, identities um, of, of women and black women, right? And that um, there's this racial and class differences that no one woman can speak for the oppression of all women. And, and depending on one's social, um, economic, political, and material conditions, um, you, 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 you will choose what you prioritize, right? Or sometimes the structures around you will choose for you what becomes priority. So there was this big debate and maybe divide that was created between um, the academic and activist uh, feminists of the time. And maybe, um, you know, this cry or lament from, from black women themselves on, on this white hegemonic, um, such condition, right, of telling Black women story, stories had, had been created. And, and so there was a cry for, for women, Black women to tell their own stories and reclaim their own narratives. Um, and I know there's one paper where um, Kiriboni Litlaka was expressing that and, and, and saying maybe in publications like Agenda and Speak, which were started, um, you know, 
around that time, um, which were trying to bring out gender issues um, and, and make them more visible, that maybe, um, you know, we should confront the fact that there has been this um, Eurocentric dominance in, in how women's stories are told, and that Black women need to come to the fore and tell their own stories. So that was important. And, and you know, in recent feminist scholarship and, and conversation, you find that there is now a making visible, there's a, a very serious, intense process of making visible um, the writings of Black women then. How did they write um, in, in autobiography, in memoirs, novels, in essays? How did they write about themselves, right? And, and what could this mean, right, about, about the experiences that wasn't said or wasn't included um, in the main academic scholarship? And the, the, the last, you know, two um, collections that I refer to here are important for my work because this was the first I've ever come across um, of the intellectual and academic work of, of a Black woman have been, you know, brought to the fore. And so the collection really um, of Fatima Mir's writing by Shireen Hasim uh, becomes important here and, and the latest um, by, you know, writings of Noni Jabavu um, really, really are important in grounding, you know, the direction that I'm trying to take. However, you know, those, those efforts are, are important, they're well and good um, in bringing out Black women's voices. However, there's, there seems to be this um, risk as we continue to do this in, in marginalizing those voices that um, were in other areas, uh, nuanced areas of social knowledge, knowledge production, right? And that was mainly through this uh, process of social research. And ignoring these, we might be erasing still, we might be reinforcing that erasure in academic discourses, um, creating this notion that Black women's writing is only important or valuable insofar as they write about themselves and their subjective experiences. And, and you know, the women that were part of the elite political movements, the ones we know of as Imboboto, right, are the ones worth reading about and knowing about. And that creates that um, danger, I think, um, in, in our silencing. Because what about those women who conducted interviews? What about the ones that translated uh, important um, research work? What about them, right? How then do we include them in these conversations that um, we are having currently? So if you're still asking yourself um, what research has to do with it, I think it has everything to do with it. Um, because how do we know what we know, right? It's through research and we use our various methods and, and our methodology um, to embark on this process. And, and it's through observing, it's through listening, it's through being, um, engaging in conversation, it's through feeling things, right? That's how we know what we know. And, and this is transferred into pen and paper and comes to shape society as it is um, today. And as we all know, I think uh, history is told by the victors. And so the process of knowledge making is, is never going to be peaceful. It's, it's, it's a battlefield where some people emerge as victors living to tell the tale while others remain victims who have their stories told for them, right? And so here in this battlefield, I think it's important that we know that African women were engaged in the battle. They were telling um, African women's stories. Um, more specifically, they were telling them through research production, participant observation, Again, it's another, you know, method which which was really, I think, with anthropology in the earlier periods that framed how um, Africans have been researched about over the years and interviewing, right, the process of tra translations, as I said, um, they, they theorized, right, they, even though they were not um, conscious of the fact that they were doing this, um, writing and reading and publishing, um, commenting on society. Those were important um, areas that I think um, we need to really take a look at. There's many that I'd love to talk about. If I do that, we, I think we're gonna stay here the whole day. Um, for today, I just wanna focus on this uh, one particular uh, woman, scholar, researcher, um, you know, intellectual, Phyllis Ndandala and, as you can see, born in 1920, 
from this uh, rural area in the Eastern Cape at Kubeni. Um, she went to the mission schools of the day, um, Healed Town and later um, Forte. She qualified as a teacher um, and then went on to complete a diploma at UCT in, in Native Administration. Um, that landed her a job in the South African Institute of Race Relations where we know they conducted these um, surveys, right, on the conditions of, of racism um, in South Africa. And they also assisted people who, who came to their offices, you know, if they found themselves in contravention of um, the past laws or the influx control uh, measures of the government. And that is really where even before that, as a teacher, right, where she 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 lived amongst these women who were of a lower class than her than hers, um, peasant workers, and you know she would engage and 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 have conversations with them. But now more so as as working for the South African Institute, that she gets to um, really intentionally find out about them, right? Um, but apart from the autobiography, which you see on the screen, um, A Life's Mosaic, her writings have not been very widely circulated in, in, in feminist literary spaces or gender studies programs. Um, the books that I will refer to today, just two of them, um, you know, you find them at the back of library shelves somewhere. One of them I found, you know, from, from your institution, UKZN, but it's it's as if they are, you know, left to be forgotten. And I think the signals once again, um, that intellectual um, erasure that we, we are talking about in feminist circles today. So 1956, she publishes her first article, The Widows of the Reserves. Um, this one was published in Africa South. Um, it was formed by Ronald Siegel in Cape Town in 56. Um, it's It's known what makes it unique is that it had a, a very academic style to it um, but really tried to bring the the, the opposition kind of writing um, so she she does do this article for Ronald who says to her that um, he, he wants in an African woman's story and Dandala is intentional from that moment um, on, on what it is that she wants to write about. And I think this quote really does encapsulate her vision for her work. And I'd like you to, if you if you wouldn't mind, um, take some time to read this for yourselves and maybe you can gain a sense or, or hear her voice, really. Right. So so these are the women that she wants to write about, the, the ones that um, nobody really cares about. And I think it, she might also be referring to the, the leaders of the, the vanguard political movements, your ANCs and, um, you know, even the Women's um, League, that th there's these women that are not you know elite educated not in 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 you know they they level and and not christian and respectable that are living life and that are trying to make sense of their reality um dandala is saying that she wants to write about them right and i think that was very um powerful for her to to make that decision then even though she belonged to um the, the educated elite um classes and then she publishes again her second article in the same publication, An African Tragedy. And here um, she describes conditions in the Cape in what was called emergency camps that were created by the Cape's local authorities, the Divisional Council. Um, so the, the Cape was embarking in this broader plan of removing um, natives that were idling, right, not doing anything, who had settled in, in these slums. Um, they were clearing the slums um, with, with the promise of creating um, the, the single labor lodges for them and anyone else who hadn't 
found work right within a certain period would have to um, return to the rural reserves. Um, and Dandala visited one of the camps. She says she went with, um, you know, while she was teaching with a colleague. Um, and as typical of her writing, right? She, she offers this very descriptive and emotive rendering of the, the poverty and the strife that she saw in front of her eyes. And more importantly, how that physically and psychologically um, impacted the black woman um, be, because of these migrant labor and past law systems and um, the influx control measures of the government. So again, if you take the time Right. So I think that is really to allow you to see or, you know, get a sense of how she, she was writing. Um, another thing that, that made her work unique is, is just the sense that you get, right, from, from women that are giving their testimonies um, in, in Kosa, speaking the language that she understands, um, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a way in which, you know, by, by, by telling her what they've been experiencing and going through that in, in their language that you get to feel, right, and, and sort of live through, right, the, 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 the women themselves. And I think um, this particular quote does, um, in a sense, capture that. Um, she met U Mrs. Dumani in one of those um, emergency camps. Mrs. Dumani was now living with her second husband um, after having lost her first one to, to TB. He left obviously for to, to find work in the urban areas and left her in the reserves. And um, they also lost their two children, unfortunately. And um, she had to abandon the home in the in the reserves and, and go to the urban area in the Cape to look for work where she met and married this um, second husband. Um, and like many of the displaced families of the Cape, um, they were trying to pick up the scraps and, and, and carve out a, de a decent life for themselves. And Dandala goes on to describe how while Mrs. Dumani was um, talking to her, um, the husband was trying to build this shack or, you know, and and she, she really describes how he was doing it with such care and and and. It, 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 there was a sense that Africans still wanted to to have that dignity, right? Even if they were living in complete, um, you know, um, dire conditions that the government had placed them in. So when she says this in in narrating her story of all that she's been through, right? The devil asked asked God to give him. Um, to, to him as a present and, and and God did. And I think translating it doesn't do it justice, right? I don't, I don't feel that the same, it doesn't have the same resonance, right? As I, as I get when, when, I, when I read it in, in, in their language. And I think that was one of the elements that gave Dandala that insider status that um, you wouldn't otherwise get if this were, um, you know, a European scholar, a translator, and maybe a male translator, right? And um, Mrs. Dumana. So it's important that um, she she was this, um, and and she was able to to come into these spaces and speak to these women. Um, I think all of this offers her work such nuance, right, and depth, um, an element that we couldn't get in in mainstream academia without the presence of um, African translation and, and interpretation. So Dandala really is engaged in this process of constructing knowledge by being, 
right? Being an African uh, Kosa woman, uh, in close proximity to these women, observing their conditions. Um, some of them she says she grew up with, perhaps um, relating their lives to her own, um, conversing with them, listening um, to their testimonies. And later on, she remembers some of those things because she had to go to exile with her um, husband, A.C. Jordan, who left on an exit permit uh, because they, the government refused to give them, you know, a passport, give him a passport, actually. And so while there, by 1976, um, she publishes both the Widows of the Reserves, African Tragedy, and a range of other, um, you know, articles or essays into this book called An African Tragedy, The Black Woman Under Above Date. Um, and also the first article was actually published by Langston Hughes in, 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 in the USA in his anthology of African writers called An African Treasury. So it makes her work also part of the civil rights politics of the time and, and that kind of transatlantic um, links that were taking place between writers. So I'm going to come back to current feminist writing and scholarship and just go through this element that I found when reading the latest edited collection by Nomboniso Gasa. She again includes um, many different women writing about rewriting the meta narratives that we have, right, of, of Black women in, in South Africa. So somewhere in between, somewhere in the vast space in between the extremes to which the pendulum swings, there is a rich, textured, layered, and complex discourse of experience of women making sense of their lives and finding new agency and ways of being, right? So, so who are the women in between? Who are these women that are in um, the vastness? How do we locate those women as um, feminist scholars of today? And I think this is if you haven't already thought about what Dandala was saying in the beginning, right, that she wanted to write about those women that nobody ever talks about, that don't really matter in these um, um, political movements and circles where there's, there's only a certain kind of woman that emerges as a hero. So I think that is important and, and it really compels one to think, right, of, of how occupying the space in academia serves the women that are in the in-between. Does it ever, right? It makes me think of maybe my mother, um, you know, my grandmother who might have never used the word feminism, but live feminism every day, right? Thinking of my sisters, some of my friends who don't even know that I'm having this lecture with you today. Um, but uh feminism incarnate and I, I would impose them you know my perception of feminism and call them feminists but do they even want to call themselves feminists and I, I observe how some of you know that is is related to their immediate and material conditions that I, I cannot sit in my in my office and 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 start you know passing judgment on how they should be experiencing and living out their lives. So I think this is important um, to, to think about as well. So it kind of brings us back to that um, vision that Dandala had. And in, in, in Gasa's own contributions to, to the collection, she speaks of how the narrative of the, of the Women's March in 1956 was one that ignored or didn't bring enough attention to the activities of the women before that in, in, in the 1913 anti-pass campaign. Um, that, you know, Cheryl Walker, for instance, really her writing is seminal to, towards that uh, moment in history. And she says that it doesn't acknowledge that Black women acted as agents, right, in, in their own polit political lives and, and went out and demonstrated against the passes in 1913 and that it was against what the male leaders would have wanted, right? It was against the role that uh, male leaders had designated for women and that we should celebrate and acknowledge that for what it was and, 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 and not, you know, write about it as, by the way, they also did march in 1913 and, you know, the, the true heroes were in 1956. Uh, basically, that's, that's what I found. 
And this is something Dandala also expresses um, in a section of her book in, in African Tragedy, where she, she speaks of this militancy in campaigning against the past books by women in 1913. Um, the working class women, she says, and the trade unions um, were very important in re-energizing the demonstrations. And again, in 1919, we see women at the forefront of this. So I think our responsibility then wouldn't be just to point out the, the, the blind spots of the walkers of this world, um, but I think to consider how, you know, writings of Black women throughout history then, right, up until the moment we are in, have been in conversation with mainstream academic writing and may have complicated the narrative, even if they weren't acknowledged as, as we would want to, even if they were not referenced as much as we would want to, because some of the, 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 the um, essays I read in there, really you can see that there's a sense of, it's, it's, she's in sync with some of what's in the mainstream. She's reading what's in the mainstream. She's reading other men's writing. Um, it's just that, and again, this goes back to censorship and, and the fact that she's in exile and et cetera, that we, we cannot see it really um, part of the, the academic um, circles. So in collections such as these, I think it, it appears as though we limit the debate to just ourselves as feminists of today and the, the white feminists of then and now, right? And, and I think the task is to... Um, remove that exclusivity and start to critique and start to really go into the content of what uh, Dandala and others were saying in, in the notes that they were making through, through the research um, that they were doing. How is it that they were complicated complicating or maybe trying to get into the conversation that was in academic discourse. And let's do it now, right? Let's let's do it now because really I, I don't think there's anything we are saying today that they haven't said already. Uh, right. So so how do we silence, right? We, we converse with it. We don't we don't just cut and paste the text on, on new sheets of paper and say, there it is, it's now visible, it's unseen. And, and leave it at that, we have to be um, critical of it as well. So I'm gonna just provide one more example, which I think brings in, you know, all that Ndandala has been doing um, before she went to exile, during exile, and now in 1984, when she was writing here in Sichaba. So Sichaba was an, um, an ANC publication, Black Womanhood and National um Liberation is this article that she published in there. And here she was making theoretical contributions, I think, to, to what national liberation is for women. Um, and, and, in, and she was stating that in analyzing women's oppression, it's important to look at race and class consciousness, um, that women that are in the ANC and um, other vanguard political movements um, should try and reconnect with what working class women and peasant women were, were going through and maybe um, include their needs, right? Um, especially with um, them trying to become constituents in the new um, constitution and, and, and ANC. Um, that Another aspect that I think is interesting is, is her regard of feminism. And, and she makes it clear and argues that it, feminism had so many positive tenets that, and, and the basic framework of what feminism is, is not completely useless in, in South African conditions. It's just that um, the, the, the earlier um, suffragette movement, you know, was racially you know um um loaded because again the, the white women who were fighting for the vote earlier on was was saying we 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 can't not have the vote because um a, a black man has the vote and again there's that racial connotation to that but other than those uh moments where the movement does become a, a, a racialized she says traditionalists shouldn't just completely disregard right and do away with with um, feminism and the men in the ANC should acknowledge right that feminism and and women's rights must also be prioritized and and not 
rely on on that idea that the, the the women's liberation movement or feminism in South Africa is is a white movement and so they cannot um take those issues seriously and again they should go back and face the the, the truth that even in the pre pre-colonial right patriarchy did function in in society um as as something that provided opportunity for women to be um marginalized and oppressed so i think that is important and and I, I, again i don't think she's saying much that is new or much that we're not saying today but it's important that we go back and and critically analyze it right and and really cite it and, and break it apart so that it becomes part of our conversation and it, it again compels us to revisit our positionality our insider or outsider status um, is racial difference um, really more important than class difference, right? I think that's an important question, um, especially as we sit in 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 our you know educated positions, um, and and given the fact that we still measure academic achievements, um, you know, by standards that were set for us and, and not created for us, but by us. And, and that, you know, and Dandala also does say that she does question it. She wrote another book called The Writer and His Social Responsibility, that what is the role of Imbomi, for instance, that's a, 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 a praise poet. What is the role? They, they are there to question society. And the only way they can do that is by attuning themselves with what the reality of society is right so i think it's important for us to to do that to to embark in a in a, in a practice of it being more attuned and and maybe um through critically analyzing works such as Ndandala and other work by 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 black women we can come now to 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 a point where we truly you know unsilence um their voices so I think I've, I've, I must have left you with more questions um, than answers, as, as any research uh, would have you do. And I, and I think, you know, as I continue doing the, the, the research, um, the questions will be answered. Um, but for today, I look forward to the conversation and, and what you thought about this work. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. And Dombe Ukulube Ganga in Tabazondi no Kasham. The sky has no limit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good people, questions. Thank you, Sis uh, Pamela, for encouraging our guests to put questions there. I hope, uh, Dombe, you, you will be able to read if there are any questions. Uh, questions on our chat chat room. Questions, please, or comments. Hmm? Yes, it is a fantastic um, presentation. I, I could see the, the comments there. Are there any questions? Any comments verbally? You know, while people are still thinking, um, it makes me even to think of like what you said of um, 
the wife of John Langalbali Ledube, the first wife, Noctela Mamdima. You know, she was there together with him um, erecting the school Oshange, the formation of Ilangai in 1903. But everything that is written or being said is about Dube. Dube did this, Dube did that. So she becomes a shadow. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with you on that, that some of these women, like like in Dandala, she was the wife of A.C. Jordan. And it's as if history remembers her as that, right? Not as a writer and a researcher in her own right. And she she does say talk about this really when her husband unfortunately does um, pass away that for the first time she 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 was recognized for her own work. Um, she, she wasn't just known as the wife of AC Jordan anymore. Um, she started getting invites to speak um, in, in, you know, rallies, um, political and academic conferences in her own right. And I think that is so very important. It's I think it's also important that she 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 uses her name, her maiden name, to, to, to title her book, African Tragedy, um, and the, the autobiography. But in, in, in um, the translated book of A.C. Jordan's, <laughs> uh, Jordan uses her married name. So it's, it's very interesting. She's Priscilla P. Jordan in, um, in, in, in A.C. Jordan's Wrath of the Ancestors. And I also find that kind of um, something to look more into as to, and this is an aspect I think I didn't talk about on, on how male writers were also acting as, as gatekeepers in, in women being able to express um, knowledge, right, about society. So yes, A.C. Jordan is, is and even, you know, with, with the politics of trade union movements, um, they were part of teachers trade union movements at the Cape, um, was very supportive of Dandala and, um, and the work she was doing. Um, but again, there, there was that culture of silencing by male leaders as well. And if you are married to a, a male scholar or intellectual, you will unfortunately um, come under his... Um, you know, prominence. So I think that is also an important aspect that um, is coming undone in the work that I'm doing. Uh, Bussi, are you able to see the, uh, the chat on your side? Sisi? Yes, I can see it. I can see oh. it. Okay, that, that's some... Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, exciting comments and also some questions there. Okay. I'm not sure if I will find a question. Okay, like the other one that I can see here. Thank you, Busi. That was awesome. May you, uh, could you tell us a bit more about some of other personalities that will be in your dissertation? It's one of the questions. Oh, okay. Oh yes, that's that's one of the questions. Thank you. Um, I think the second slide does show um, some of the women that I will be including. Fatima Mir, again, taught at the university. I, th I think you know this and has done incredible work and left such a legacy. But had started um, a research institute actually in, in the late 70s, um, the Institute for Black Research, where her students and, and other you know, researchers were coming together and, and conducting these very vigorous um, you know, research studies on the, the, the life of, of 
families, especially women um, in, in, in Natal, in factories, in the home, um, the experiences as workers, etc. Um, the IBR published a range of these um, studies interviewing thousands of people at times, um, at a time, right? And in Con conducting surveys, etc. So I'm going to be um, that that work is going to feature in in my research quite prominently as well. But along with Dandala's generation, I'd say um, Loretta Ngobo is is going to be uh, one of the figures, very important, um, especially for for the work she does in exile and kind of bringing together women who were, who were writing in exile um, in her autobiography and, and in her kind of fictional autobiographical work. Um, but that still demonstrated, for instance, how women in rural areas were, were protesting against um, colonial and apartheid structures. So that is also going to be important. Um, I will be using, you know, Ellen Kuzayo's of, of, of the day, um, just to show how her contemporaries were also um, engaged in this process of trying to, to make knowledge. Um, I think later on, you'll find in, in trade union movement um, mobilization, you know, other not, you know, um, autobiographies that are not known, such as Emma Machinini's um, Strikes Have Followed Me All My Life, that one is is also important in in bringing in a not a non ANC perspective, right? To um, and a non ANC women's league perspective to how um, women made sense of their material conditions and how they were going to fight against them. So she uh, becomes a leader of very important uh, trade union movement at the time. So I think I'm going to do that and bring in the sort of research that was starting to happen, cultural groups that were now being formulated by women within the trade unions, because the, the, there was a clearer sense by, by the 80s, right, and in, in early 90s that um, the trade, the, the people in the trade unions and the, the political leaders were speaking different languages, right, and more so for women. So the women leading the the the, the ANCs and and you know Vanguard organizations were really disconnected with what was happening in the trade unions and in the community organizations, right? Um, the, the the reality of women making um, or creating stock fells and and creating other you know community based organizations really is 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 divorced from what is happening in mainstream politics, even if the politics at the time were in exile. So I'm going to uh, feature that. And I think I'm going to bring it back to the conference that I started with um, in the beginning to, to, to highlight then how those conversations um, that happened in 1991 are a consequence of um, ignoring right that important work that women have been doing all along so yes that's my answer for that thank you so much whilst you are still maybe looking at other questions there is another question that are you going to include uh, Mabele in your work Um, can I have more on that, Mabele? I don't know whether it's Mabele. In fact, I just thought of even of uh, like, yeah, it, it says Mabele. Would you be including Mabele in your research as well? No, no, I wouldn't. No, I'm not going to include. Um, but if I do come across, you know, yeah. If, if she's done research, I think, yes, it might figure in my work as I go along. I'm not really sure which Mabele is the person referring to. Someone is thinking of Madlamini here that uh, participated in 19, that he participated in Deppen Corporation Municipality. And there's another question. Uh, it says in a book, it is difficult to find. Perhaps someone could republish it today. 
who is the original publisher. Thanks for introducing such, uh, uh, introducing us to her work. Yes, so the original publisher for an African tragedy is Agasha Productions. It, it was actually um, based in Detroit in, in, in the USA because that's where she ended up um, and it was released in 1976. Um, so like I said, it, it, it was at the time where the civil rights politics, um, you know, that's why even the likes of uh, Langston Hughes were taking it up and Langston Hughes also included AC Jordan's work in there as well. So she, she was published by that uh, because she was in exile. And again, censorship in South Africa, um, that book wouldn't have been um, highly circulated. She, I said the one copy is with UKZN and the other is at UCT. Those are the only two. And then a writer in his social responsibility is in UNISA and there's one copy and like I said at the back of the shelf somewhere um, so I agree it's very important that these books are, are maybe republished and, and brought you know to, to public circulation I think it, that's very important for us to um, think about or hope for really. Uh, says Pamela uh, let, let me ask since we started at five past two. Um, are we going to be cut off if we um, finish at five past three? No, we won't be cut off. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trying to look for other questions here. Uh, uh, well, with the comments, Busi, you, you will read them yourself, yeah? Yes, uh, I see this one asking why the specific interest in social research? Yes. What does that mean? Um, I think I did mention this previously um, on on social research being where knowledge about society is constructed. I think that that is important. And especially if we say, you know, mainstream academia marginalized the, the, the writing of, of black women, then we need to go beyond mainstream academia, right? We need to dig deeper into then how was this um, discourse and knowledge uh, made? And I think where women, uh, black women, obviously, who knew the language of area, the area who came from er certain areas. If you're thinking of, um, I forgot to mention actually, um, Manton Kutswe is a woman who conducted interviews for a very seminal feminist body of work by Bel Belinda Bozzoli. Um, she was from the area in which those interviews were conducted in Fukien, and you know, so it's so it's important that we we understand who who Mantong Godzwe was, who why she participated in that. Um, when she was conduct, conducting the interviews, um, what was her specific contribution? Did she have an aim in doing the work that was different to the aim that Bozoli had, right? And later she also does interviews um for Shula Marx's um not even an experimental doll and this was after i think uh, marx had come into contact with the material the letters from mabel palmer you know with with the lily the 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 young girl in the in the book but now you know they were looking for lily moya and they, they found they found her eventually and also was the one who who interviewed her i i have two recordings of the interview where really um, Lily Moya was now psychologically 
you know, unwell. And and she, she the the way that she she speaks in that particular interview, you can tell that um it wasn't even supposed to be conducted. Um and so that that again brings questions of ethics um in conducting research, why in God's way couldn't carry it on um fulfilling this um you know academic duty, even though she can see that you know it's 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 it wasn't um this she she wasn't going to give her the answers that she needed so it's it's all of those so in in the process of research we we need to see um how exactly black women or africans themselves um what they thought they were doing what what they were aiming to achieve right i think that's that's really the basis of of my focusing on social research and also like i said because i mean autobiography has been analyzed and reanalyzed so many times and um i think we need to move beyond that point uh, we will take two questions uh, mashubi and then before mashubi there's a question from you will answer maybe both of them that says of course, that it is thinking you. What more can be can be done within within academia to further include women or women and bring their stories to the forefront? Mashobi, you you take you respond to both. These are last question, folks. So uh, Good afternoon, mm, and uh, specifically to our. Keynote speaker. Uh, apologies, I did enter the talk late. I would have loved to engage you more about the material you presented. So maybe I will just take the opportunity to ask you a more um, scholarly question. Also, an aside, it would have been lovely to put uh, names and faces together, but I see everyone's camera is off. So, you know, uh, in Rome, we do as Romans do. Uh, my question, uh, because we, we're speaking about something that pertains to women, is uh, recently we just saw in Italy, um, although they do have a, a politics change very often, but a new government installed with a prime minister who is a, a female. I think also back to the prime minister of uh, New Zealand, I forget her name now, who was who has received so much uh, acclaim over the last couple of years, specifically with the handling of the pandemic and also just how they responded to other issues. And I think also about South Africa, where we are yet to have a, a, a woman in the number one seat, although it did come close um, a couple of years ago. What, is this something that is significant? Is this a milestone that should be passed? And, uh, I'd just like to get some of your thoughts on that, the significance, the importance, and the potential that women leadership can play uh, politically. And even in the judiciary, we saw women get slighted for the number one role. Just like your opinions on some of these matters. Thank you. Bosi, can we take one more? This is now the end. Are, are you fine? Okay. Or, you want to respond? No, it's fine. Can you, um, you want no, to respond? No, I, I yes. think. I think I'll, I'll just answer the question firstly without, that's on the chat uh, the chat that um, you said what more can be done within academia to bring women's work to the fore hey and I think that goes back to the the quotes that I showed you on the women in between and and how I reflected on how these women are next to me the that how these women are I live with every day and these are not women that um I have to go go look for far and in between and I think really what what Dandala was doing is what I'm trying to do right and and it's that effort from and, and a conscious effort from from feminist scholars i think to to do justice to to the women around them and and the experiences of different women and and not pass judgment on what you know they they ought to be um prioritizing and and whether or not they should have a feminist praxis um the way we have right so i think that is that is what we we can do and and to include them in the conversation much more deliberately um because like i said i i, I don't know if 
you know, I've ever had a sit down with the the women in my family about what feminism is. So it, it kind of shows you, right, just how ourselves disconnected we might be, right, from what the experiences of, of, of the women around us and really the issues that they are dealing with today are. And those issues are material at, at most times. Um, most people are just um, trying to feed their families and, you know, talking to them about um, abstract ideological, um, you know, frameworks doesn't really do much but how then do we include um the, their voices in, in a way that matters that m allows them to know that they are also heard i think that that's something that we, we should be doing more of and and be conscious of doing um and even as we go back and read and and try to find um women's voices in in history um we should that that should be our um, outlook, right? As as to how do we make an impact for for the everyday woman, and not just you know how we get accolades for for academic, you know how, who wrote the best paper or published the best book. <laughs> Basically, that's what I'm saying. And uh, to go back to what um, the gentleman, I can't remember your name. I'm sorry, has, was asking. Uh, oh, you know, <laughs> if I answer your question, I think we're going to go back to it's going to take another hour. And, and again, this, I think, reflects some of the conversation that happens in, in the social media space a lot. Um, I, you know, you, you'd have to go into a Twitter space where feminism is spoken about, for instance, where there's this whole debate about, you know, should a woman ever, you know, be allowed to lead the, a country in Africa, especially compared to um, women that have been leading in, in, in other areas? And the, the answer will always be the same. Um, ju just having a woman is it might not be enough because, again, um, what this woman could be just holding space for man or a man right this woman could just be um exercising or patriarchy and perpetuating patriarchy in the same way a man would and right so so how then would that particular woman leading a country um be intentional about um eradicating the the, the patriarchal forces that lead to so much gender-based violence and 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 you know abuse of um children and all of these issues that we face um because of it right so i think they, they cannot be a definite answer it's it's all about uh, just because you're a woman it doesn't mean right that you will um advance feminist or or, or fulfill the role for women it might just mean that you are holding space for a man to continue having his way so i i don't know i'm, I'm not going to give you a definite answer for that <laughs> however i think it's enough um to 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 for you to tell where my head is at um, with regards to that thank you very diplomatic if i can just provoke one more time uh, um as, a, as an academic, I think one of the more um, controversial things that's been happening recently is, and I, I don't maybe expect you to comment on the material factors of it, but just the perception of it. Uh, one of the sort of biggest controversies that's been in the academic space, higher education space, has been what's been unfolding at UCT, the University of Cape Town, and some of the allegations of infighting uh, forwarded at the director to the VC, uh, Bakeng, and some of the, what I could say, are uh, her uh, opposers within the, the, the senior leadership at UCT. Uh, optically, it, to the outside, it looks as though here's a university which has been run by women who are now uh, seemingly falling prey to infighting and, and power dynamics and power struggles. Do you have any opinion on uh, the UCT matter from the optics of it as a feminist? <laughs> Must be, you be, know? no, I'm, I'm going to kindly decline to answer the question. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not gonna go there. Um, yeah, <laughs> 
sorry about that but we, no, we no. can engage maybe at another time yeah, um, yes, please, between please, ourselves please. but i'm not going to do that here sorry all right it's, it's, it was much of it is my son is in cape town but one more question then i will hand it over to the head of uh, Campbell Collections uh, under the university, part of the University of KwaZulu uh, Natal. Are you going to uh, involve other voices? One that prominent one from the PAC is like <clears throat> Zondin Sobukwe. Then I'm out of here. Thanks so much, folks. Then I'll give it to, to Senzo. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like I said, if, even if it, it, it might have been that Ndantala, you know, is the one who becomes the center of, of a particular chapter, I think all of the other links are created by women in other spaces and Dandala was also um, affiliated to some extent to politics of the PAC. Um, Black consciousness politics are also going to form a, a, a major part, especially regarding the work of Fatima Mir. So um, th there's there's always going to be um, connections, right, that are drawn in, in the politics of the time, in publications started by political movements, and then in the actual research that um, involved um, collecting, you know, information or data from communities. So yeah, definitely that, that will be included. What in Timbogoto, what in Tabafaz, what in Tabafaz, what in Timbogoto. A very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Mr. Sazum Kiza, the head of the Campbell Collections and Special Collections. On behalf of the Campbell Collections and the University of Kwazu Natal Library Services, I'm glad to be here to express my vote of thanks. A special thanks to our guest speaker. Ms. Sbusisi Wengongo for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. Your thoughts have truly inspired us. I thank our director, Dr. Nontla Tlanzobo, and our portfolio head, Dr. Roshin Peth, for always supporting and guiding us. Thanks to our facilitator and member of the Kili Campbell Alvaza Report, Mr. Muzwadile Hatebe for taking his time and assist us to make this lecture a success. Thanks to the UKZN Corporate Relations, especially Ms. Pamela Adams. You have always been generous with your time when we need your help. This lecture wouldn't be a success without your help. Thanks to the chair of the board of the Campbell Collections, I think he is present with us, <coughs> and the entire board members who are here with us today. Thanks to our archivist, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Nomvuyom Kulisa for organizing this lecture. She's not with us today. She took leave because there is an, uh, an emergent at home. She had to go home in the Eastern Cape, in the Eastern Cape to attend to that emergent. Thanks to the Campbell Collection staff and the entire staff and student of the University of KwaZulu-Natal who attended this uh, session. I would also like to thank each and every one of you for being here and making this day a wonderful and memorable one. I hope you'll be with us again next year. Thank you once again. We are closing the lecture now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senzo. Thank you.